Unitarian Universalists, and welcome to our online worship service on the Sunday before Earth Day. I am Reverend Dr. Lisa Hike, the parish minister here, and with me this morning as our celebrant is Tricia Lewis. Brian Shaw is our musician, and we'll be hearing later from guest musicians Sarah Thompson and Peter Mayer. The great and wonderful May Vader is helping us with technology today. May is going to be recording the service to post to our YouTube channel later on. So if you don't want to have your face or name preserved for posterity, you might want to turn off your video and rename yourself. Otherwise, we're super happy to see your faces. If this is your first time visiting a Unitarian Universalist congregation, you should know that we are a people who find truth and beauty in all of the world's religions, believing that no one path has a monopoly on truth. And we don't just tolerate differences. We actively affirm and welcome and celebrate them. So no matter where you come from or how bumpy your life's journey has been, you are welcome here. No matter whom you love, whatever your gender identity, the color of your skin, what you hold to be sacred, or what your economic situation, you are welcome here. Whoever you are and whatever you're seeking, you are welcome here. All through the month of April, this congregation is asking the question, what does it mean to be a people of becoming? On this Sunday before Earth Day, we'll think about how we might become our best and truest selves, joyfully, radiantly alive, deeply aware of our place in the interdependent web of life and sure of our role in preserving life on earth. So come now, let us bring our whole selves to this time together and let us worship. We'll begin by centering through music. Each Sunday, 
Unitarian Universalists all around the world join together in lighting a chalice, the symbol of our faith. You are invited to light your own chalice at home now, or just a candle, as I speak these words from Robert Weston. Out of the stars in their flight, out of the dust of eternity, here have we come. Stardust and sunlight mingling through time and through space. Out of the stars have we come, up from time, out of the stars have we come. Time out of time before time in the vastness of space, earth spun to orbit the sun, earth with the thunder of mountains newborn, the boiling of seas, earth warmed by sun, lit by sunlight, this is our home. Out of the stars have we come. Mystery hidden in mystery, back through all time. Mystery rising from rocks in the storm and the sea. Out of the stars, rising from rocks and the sea, kindled by sunlight on earth, arose light. Ponder this thing in your heart. Ponder with awe. Out of the sea to the land, out of the shallows came ferns. Out of the sea to the land, up from darkness to light, rising to walk and to fly, out of the sea trembled life. Ponder this thing in your heart, life up from sea, eyes to behold, throats to sing, mates to love. Life from the sea, warmed by sun, washed by rain, life from within, giving birth, rose to love. This is the wonder of time. This is the marvel of space. Out of the stars swung the earth. Life upon earth rose to love. This is the marvel of life, rising to see and to know. Out of your heart, cry wonder. Sing that we live. Yes. 
I think it's my turn and I seem to have unspotlighted myself. <laughs> now is the time in our service when we share our joys and our sorrows. We make sacred the milestones of our lives by sharing them with each other. We have here a bowl of water and some stones. The stones symbolize our joys and sorrows and the water symbolizes our community, which holds them. If you have a joy or sorrow you want to share with all here, you can type it into the chat and choose a stone to represent what you have shared. If you are carrying a joy or sorrow in your heart that is too tender to share, just type the word stone into the chat and choose a stone to represent it. If you have something heavy weighing on your heart and you'd like to talk to Reverend Lisa or a member of our pastoral care team about it, please go to our website at nbuu.org where you can find information about how to reach us. Now, before the rest of us get started, one of our newest members, Kaylin Matthews, has a special joy that she would like to share. You know, I'm a retired minister. When I first began that journey many decades ago, I was at a very low point. My husband couldn't find work. We were in fear of losing our home and our relationship felt the strain of it all. You could say it was my biblical desert experience. Then at a little church in the Mojave Desert, <laughs> yes, I literally did live in the desert. I first learned the spiritual principle of tithing. I learned that we always have faith, but it acts on us where we put our focus. At that time, all my faith was centered on my lack and on our needs. But by participating in the gift of tithing, I was able to shift my focus to the goodness and prosperity that was all around me. I never looked back. In my membership interview with Reverend Lisa, I told her my greatest joy in joining NBUU was to once again have a spiritual home to which I could joyfully give my tithe. Because I know that the benefits, both personally and to my congregation, will go far beyond the dollar value of my gift. And I can't wait to see that happen. So my stone of joy today is for the chance to once again tithe to where I receive my spiritual food. Thank you. Thank you, Kaylin. Now let us begin our time of sharing.
when we share our sorrows and our joys, we weave together the disparate strands of our lives into a web that lifts and supports us all. Now, let's go deeper. I invite you to get comfortable in your seat, and if you like, place your feet on the floor. Close your eyes if that helps you listen more deeply. Pull your shoulders up to your ears and then drop them. Rotate them a few times and then shake out any negative energy you may have accumulated during the week. <clears throat> Receive a breath from the green growing beings of the world and then return the carbon dioxide back to those green growing beings in and then out. A second breath in and then out. A third breath in and then out. Feel your place in the breathing of the world as you hear these words. Spirit of life, great and silent force that uncurls the spirals of ferns and the spines of fetal vertebrates. Now is normally the time when spring rains keep hillsides green and lush and wildflowers blooming in joyful colors. It's normally the time when we revel in sudden showers from huge puffy clouds and the tender bright green of new oak leaves against clear blue sky. But this is the third driest year on record and the wild oats and other grasses are already going to seed. Rhododendrons are already opening in the forests when they should come out in June. A warm, dry wind sweeps across the landscape, further drying plants and soils. Our planet has a fever. How do we bear it? How do we bear it knowing that it will get worse before it gets better, if it gets better at all? Help us allow ourselves to grieve. Help us know that our grief arises from our love, which arises from our interdependence with all life on earth. If we can allow ourselves to grieve, if we can sob and wail and stomp our feet, if we can release the tears that clog our throats, we can recover our voices. We can come back to life. We can act from our love on behalf of all life. Spirit of life, nothing is stronger than you are the power of greening. You rise in the trees, you swim in the waters, you fly in the air, you crawl on the earth, you move in our hearts as love, love that is stronger than death. In our hour of need, we pray. Rise in us and overflow as the tears that express our love and clear the way for you to move as the wisdom we need to know how to act and the strength we need to do it. Rise in us, O oh spirit of life, and help us make all things new. Amen. Ashe. All our relations. Blessed be. Now, let us enter together into a time of silence. The music will bring us out.
Our reading today comes from the great Oglala Lakota holy man, known in English as Black Elk, the sacred hoop. Then I was standing on the highest mountain of them all, and round beneath me was the whole hoop of the world. And while I stood there, I understood more than I could tell, and I understood more than I saw. For I was seeing in the sacred manner the shape of all things of the spirit and the shapes as they must live together like one being. And I saw that the sacred hoop of my people was one of many hoops that make one circle wide as daylight and starlight. And in the center grew one mighty flowering tree to shelter all the children of one mother and one father. And I saw that it was holy.
is the wind from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south, breathing in, breathing out. By your breath, by your blood, by your body, by your spirit, we are all one. By your breath, by your blood. The year was 1986, 35 years ago. I had just started a master's program in environmental science, and I was pregnant with my first child. I was taking a class called Ecosystem Assessment, and the professor explained what was then called the greenhouse effect, or global warming. How, as gases like carbon dioxide and methane build up in the atmosphere, they trap solar energy in the form of heat, which causes the whole planet to grow warmer. 
He pointed us to scientific articles from as early as the turn of the 20th century when automobiles were just coming into fashion, warning that unchecked use of fossil fuels worldwide could cause melting of the polar ice caps, which would result in rising sea levels, which would in turn displace billions of poor people who live at or below sea level around the world. It could change climate patterns, causing super storms and massive droughts and resulting in the forced migration of people dependent on subsistence farming. It could result in the reappearance of diseases formerly thought to be under control and the appearance of new diseases as humans moving into previously unfarmed areas encountered wildlife carrying them. In 1986, all of this was so well understood that a politician like Al Gore could write a book about it, hoping to reach the average American and prompt a revolution in energy use and policy. Instead, the opposite happened. Exxon and other fossil energy companies spent billions and billions of dollars on campaigns to malign climate scientists and obfuscate what had previously been crystal clear. Instead of moving away from fossil fuels, subsequent administrations actually made policy that made us more dependent on them. I remember how horrified I was when President Barack Obama in a State of the Union address actually touted increases in fracking as a positive accomplishment of his administration. So all this time, since 1986, I have been carrying the knowledge that our planet was undergoing rapid changes that could make it uninhabitable by humans within the next hundred years. At that time, there wasn't a word for what I felt, the wrenching pain and anxiety that kept me awake at night whenever I allowed myself to think about what was really happening. Only in the last few years has the term ecological grief bubbled up in our collective consciousness. Climate anxiety is another one. That feeling privileged people like me get when they first learn about the real state of the planet and they look around and see how many people refuse to believe in the findings of science and how little is being done to change the way rich countries live. Of course, people on the front lines of climate change don't have the luxury of feeling climate anxiety from a safe distance. Just as predicted, they're having to leave their desiccated farms or their flooded islands and coastlines or their melting permafrost and try to emigrate to other places that won't let them in. Just as predicted, they're having to settle in areas not previously farmed before, where they come into contact with wild animals carrying diseases that humans have not yet encountered, such as Zika and Ebola, and now the coronavirus. The immigration crisis is a climate crisis. The pandemic is also a climate crisis. Even those of us who formerly used to be able to watch all this from a safe distance are now in the direct path of firestorms and floods. And those of us who understand what is happening and how interdependent we all are, we just feel even more pain. So what do we do with our pain? This is the crucial question. Do we let it paralyze us with fear and dread? fall into despair? Do we go into denial and use consumerist addictions to occupy our minds and hearts? Or do we let our pain in and let it instruct us to change? If I put my hand on a hot stove and feel pain, what should I do? Should I leave my hand there and meditate, telling myself the pain is just an illusion? Should I leave my hand there and stuff my face with chocolate or drink some really nice Napa Valley wine to take my mind off the sizzling of my flesh? 
should I call some friends over so we can talk for several hours while eating and drinking about how to develop a plan for the easiest and most gradual approach to removing my pinky finger from the hot stove? Or should I allow the pain in and let it force me to take my hand off the damn stove? The dominant culture wants very much for us not to feel our pain, wants us to harden up or just not notice so fossil fuel companies can keep making more money. It constantly bombards us with distractions like new places to shop, new goods to buy, new subdivisions with sterile parks smelling of the chemicals that keep grass green and free of weeds. Even at my local hippie food co-op, the great majority of organic foods for sale are highly processed, pre-prepared, and packaged in plastic. Ten different glossy magazines about living the simple life with the help of meditation and alternate day fasting grace every end cap, advertising recipes for paleo brownies and avocado-based chocolate mousse. It's so easy for privileged folks to be hypnotized, so easy to fall under the soporific net of all the wonderful choices for how to live your best life, barely noticing as your hand gets charred to the bone and flakes off. Yet some people sidestep that soporific net. Some notice the deception and refuse to be numbed. They remain awake and do all they can to wake up others, too. You've probably seen Greta Thunberg on television weeping as she exclaims to the UN Climate Action Summit, this is all wrong. I shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. Yet you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. Yet I'm one of the lucky ones. People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? Greta is incredible, but she is not the only child making a difference. So I won't focus on her story today. Instead, I want to share two stories, two other stories with you of people who have devoted their lives to waking us up to the sacredness of life on earth, to waking us up to our true natures, to making big and little changes that matter. Here is the first. Once upon a time, there was a little boy named Shuteshkat Martinez. Shu, as he likes to be called, was born in Colorado to a white American mother and an Aztec father from Mexico. When he was six, he and his family watched an inconvenient truth. Afterward, he was so sad and angry and afraid that he cried all night. But his determination to do something about climate change rose with the sun. So at the age of six, he joined Earth Guardians, a group founded in the 1990s by his white mother. According to its website, Earth Guardians is an intergenerational organization that trains diverse youth to be effective leaders in the environmental, climate, and social justice movements across the globe using art, music, storytelling, on-the-ground projects, civic engagement, and legal action to advance solutions to the critical issues we face as a global community. There are Earth Guardians crews all over the United States and in 61 countries around the world. Again, from the website, crews are youth-led, intergenerational groups of impassioned leaders taking action for a regenerative future. 
crews are the heartbeat of earth guardians. Crews do things like plant trees, the single most effective carbon sequestering technology in the world. They clean up waterways. They advocate for clean, renewable energy sources in their hometowns and cities. They develop regenerative farms and gardens, whatever is most needed in each place in the world. In Boulder, Colorado, where Shu and his family live, one of the things that was most needed was a ban on fracking. So the crew there rallied citizens of all ages and they got fracking banned. Then, Shu and members of Earth Guardians from all over the United States learned that many cities and counties and states already have rules in place requiring a transition from fossil fuel to renewable energy by a certain deadline, but they weren't being enforced. The kids also learned that the federal government actively promotes fossil fuel use and therefore climate change. So with the help of a law firm called Our Children's Trust, the kids started filing lawsuits. Their argument was that their rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness were being threatened by inaction on climate change. Now, these were children of every color from cities and farms and suburbs and ranches being helped by a few adults. They were doing bake sales and concerts to raise funds. The opposing arguments were being made and paid for by fossil fuel company lawyers. Who do you think has won most of the cases? Would it surprise you to know it's the kids? The case that has drawn the most public attention is Juliana versus the United States which was filed in 2015 for 18 kids, including Shuteshkot. As the case slowly wended its way up through various levels of courts and processes of appeals, it engaged the imaginations of hundreds of thousands of young people all over the world, including Greta Thunberg, and they carried out strikes and rallies in support of the lawsuit and climate action. In 2020, the case reached the United States Supreme Court. As you know, to get that far, it would have to have been won and appealed and won and appealed numerous times. The Supreme Court rejected the kids' claims on a technicality. The kids have filed a writ asking to revise the language of their initial suit and they're awaiting a reply. In the meantime, Shuteshkot has reached the age of 20. In the many videos about his life, he says his activism is fueled by the spirituality he learned from both of his parents, which holds the earth as sacred. He has, he has spoken to the United Nations and given pioneers and TED Talks. He's a hip hop artist who writes songs for his band which features his brothers and sisters and many of their friends about the interconnection of all life and the joy they find in acting on its behalf. At 16, Shu wrote and published a book called We Rise, and he's now the youth director of Earth Guardians. He says, the biggest challenge we face is shifting human consciousness, not saving the planet. The planet doesn't need saving. We do. So ends our first story. And now for the second. Once upon a time, there were 13 grandmothers. Each was a spiritual leader in her own indigenous community located all over the world. In the Oglala Lakota Nation, Nepal, Gabon, Brazil, and many other places. Each was separately given a divine vision of a council of grandmothers who would share their teachings about how to love and care for the earth and all her beings with all the people of the world for the sake of the next seven generations. So in 2004, 
they came together and formed the International Council of 13 Indigenous Grandmothers. They made a plan for how they would manifest their shared vision. One element would be to make a circle of prayer around the world. They would hold annual gatherings at which they would share their prayers and teachings and ceremonies with each other and all other people who were interested. The places they would gather would form a complete circle around the globe. Another element was to organize a water consortium at which they would join with people from all walks of life, from researchers to fisher folk who were concerned about water, the lifeblood of the earth, to share teachings about it and restore and preserve the beauty and integrity of all waterways. Along the way, they would also go speak as a group and alone wherever they were invited. Each grandmother would also continue with her own projects supported by the others. For, exam for example, grandmother Agnes Pilgrim brought back the ceremony welcoming salmon home to the Applegate River in Oregon. Grandmother Flor de Mayo started a seed temple as well as a nonprofit to support it to preserve heritage seed for future use by the next seven generations. The grandmothers have now done all of these things. They completed their circle of prayer around the world in 2016. In 2019, they published a book of sacred teachings called Grandmother's Wisdom, Reverence for All Creation. They've spoken at hundreds of venues, from pioneers to conferences of the National Organization of Women. All of this is mighty impressive, given that they celebrated the 80th birthday of one of the grandmothers during one of their very first council gatherings. Two of the grandmothers, Grandmother Agnes Pilgrim and Grandmother Julieta Casimiro, have recently died. I heard Grandmother Agnes speak once. She said, the first thing you need to do to heal Mother Earth is go talk to your river. Your river needs you to talk to it every day in order for it to be healthy. So every day you go to your river and you sit with it and you talk to it. She was teaching us that if we talk to our river and almost everyone has a river, if we talk to our river every day, a shift in our consciousness takes place. We, we begin to perceive the true nature of the sacred world. We begin to understand that every body of water, like every other part of nature, is a living being with its own needs and consciousness and rights. We begin to understand that we are interconnected with it so deeply that to protect the river is to protect ourselves. It is the same with our air and our soil, with all the creatures of the world, and with the next seven generations of our fellow humans. All are interconnected in one living, breathing, shining whole, and the whole is holy. Earth guardians and the 13 indigenous grandmothers all teach us that what happens when we let our pain for the world in is this. It doesn't bury us. It doesn't cause us to collapse in despair. Instead, it does the very opposite. If we allow it to move through us, it leads us to an ancient knowledge of something so profound and beautiful and true, that it fills us with joy and purpose. And then no matter how young we are or how old we are, we can take meaningful action to preserve life on this scarred and sacred world. And that is the end of that story. Or is it just the beginning? May it ever be so. Blessed be.
Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. Let us take some time now to engage in the spiritual practice of generosity. Once a month, this congregation gives our whole offering to a local organization whose mission aligns with our values. The recipient of this month's offering is Napa Climate Now. Here to tell us about the organization today is David Kearney Brown. I'm David Kearney Brown, co-chair of Napa Climate Now. Thank you so much for your donations today. NCN is an all-volunteer organization and the Napa affiliate of 350 Bay Area. Your donations will support our political advocacy and grassroots organizing around the critical issues of rapidly reducing emissions of greenhouse gases and drawing existing greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere through protection of forests and through regenerative soil practices. In addition to all our current work, we are looking forward to providing leadership in promoting and expanding the conversation about how to establish a just and sustainable economy and society. An economy and society that honors the natural systems on which our lives are based and at the same time provides a full human life for every person born on our planet. I have nothing but hope for such a future, but it is going to take commitment, creativity, and many conversations. If you'd like to talk further or get involved in our work, you can find Napa Climate Now on Facebook or visit our website. Thank you again for your generous support. Thank you, David. You can give to Napa Climate Now by going to our website at nbuu.org and clicking on the donate button. Or you can send a check to us at NBUU 1625 Salvador Avenue, Napa, California 94558. Write Climate Now in the memo line. The offering will now be gratefully received. Thank you for all you give and all you do to support this congregation and help build the beloved community in the Napa region and beyond. I especially want to thank Trisha for being our celebrant, Brian for his wonderful music as always, and Mae Vader for helping us with tech. Also, thanks to Kaylin for sharing her heartfelt joy at the opportunity to practice generosity with us. After our service today, we'll take about 10 minutes to take a bio break, stretch, grab a snack and a warm beverage, and then we'll come back for our social hour. It'll be right here on the same link. And if you're visiting us for the first or second time today, we encourage you to um, join us for our social hour and also to visit our website and sign up for our mailings, which will notify you of upcoming events and services. So we hope that you'll join us so we can welcome you as warmly as we would like to. 
In closing today, I offer you these beautiful words from Reverend Victoria Safford. What song? What if there were a universe, a cosmos that began in shining blackness, out of nothing, out of fire, out of a single silent breath, and into it came billions and billions of stars, stars beyond imagining, and near one of them, a world, a blue-green world so beautiful that learned clergymen could not even speak about it cogently, and brilliant scientists in trying to describe it began to sound like poets with their physics, with their mathematics, with their empirical, impressionistic musing. What if there were a universe in which a world was born out of a smallish star and into that world at some point flew red-winged blackbirds and into it swam sperm whales and into it came crocuses and wind to lift the tiniest hairs on naked arms in spring when you run out to the mailbox and into it at some point came onions out of soil and came Mount Everest and also the coyote we've been seeing in the woods about a mile from here just after sunrise in these mornings when the moon is full. The very scent of him makes his brother, our dog, insane with fear and joy and ancient inbred memory. Into that world came animals and elements and plants and imagination, the mind and the mind's eye. If such a universe existed and you noticed it, what would you do? What song would come out of your mouth? What prayer, what praises, what sacred offering, what whirling dance, what religion, and what reverential gesture would you make to greet that world every single day that you were in it? Now let us sing our closing song, Blue Boat Home.
to the waves upholding me Hail the great winds urging me on Greet the infinite sea before me Sing the sky my sailor song I was born upon the fathoms Never harbor or port have I known The wide universe is the ocean I travel And the earth is my blue boat home The wide universe is the ocean I travel We extinguish this chalice, but not the light of truth, the warmth of love, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts out into the world until we meet again. And now, people of this beloved community, each of you is a precious member of one great living, breathing body, the interdependent web of all life on earth. No matter your age or circumstance, each of you has a role to play in its healing. Go forth from this time together knowing how deeply you are loved and how much you are needed. Go shining. Blessed be.